Welcome to the opening session of the uh, 2001 American Control Conference. I'm Bruce Crow, General Chair, and that means that uh, I guess at this point now the buck stops here. So if you have any any comments, anything to say, or if we can help with anything, track me down or, or talk to the people at the registration desk. Before we introduce our plenary speaker, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce to you the president of the American Automatic Control Council, which, of, which is, of course, the organization that sponsors the American Control Conference. And he has someone himself that he will introduce. This is Professor Naeem Kerry. Thank you. And I also would like to add my welcome to uh, everyone here, and it's a pleasure to see uh, so many familiar faces and uh, many new faces as well. Uh, about a year ago, we have extended an invitation to the ITRAC, which is the International Federation of Automatic Control, to hold a annual meeting here in conjunction with ACC in 2001, and uh, the time has come for them to arrive, and they are here, and uh, we are uh, pleased that they have accepted our invitation. We're going to have a good time and a good session of uh, work scheduled for Wednesday. It's a brainstorming session. I don't think it ever happened between A squared, uh, A squared, C squared, and IFAC uh, to really put their minds together to see how we can advance our service to the uh, control community internationally. Uh, at this moment, I would like to introduce. Uh, Professor Pedro Albertus, who happens to be the president uh, of the ITAC Council. Thank you, Naim. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to be here in this uh, conference, and I would like to thank uh, Square C Square for inviting ITAC to uh, have its uh, annual council meeting here in Arlington. ITAC is a worldwide organization. Technically and geographically distributed, we have uh, 50 national member organizations. A squared Square is the USA uh, national member organization. And uh, 46 technical committees. You can participate in the activities of IPAC either through your NMO, in this case A squared Square, or your own country NMO. And also as an expert conducting directly the technical uh, committee chairs. Most of the information about IPAC is available at uh, our webpage uh, www.ipacintoncontrol.org. Uh, there you have even uh, an ombudsman mailbox where you can uh, ask questions or complaints about IPAC. Uh, even this week, you will have uh, an IFAC Secretariat office next uh, door where you can ask for information about our events and our uh, activities. That IFAC is a worldwide organization, it's very easily realized. We organize more than 30 technical events per year in different countries. Um, we have also a couple of journals, um, Automatica and Conference Engineering Practice, which are very well recognized. And also, the largest uh, automatic control events in the world, they are the IPAC World Congresses. And this also shows the spread of uh, our activity all around the world. The last uh, World Congresses were held in Berlin, uh, Sydney, San Francisco, and Beijing. And I would like to take this opportunity to invite all of you for the next IPAC World Congress. We expect more than 2,000 participants, and it will be in Barcelona in the next year, in July 2002. I would like to end my talk just uh, thanking Esports Square for this invitation. Uh, I'm sure that this week will be plenty of uh, interest and success. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Albertus. Uh, you'll be seeing a lot of IPAC people around. Uh, make them feel welcome. Welcome, and uh, talk a little bit about uh, the activities of IPAC. 
We have a lot of people here, and I want to ask before we get started with the plenary talk, would everyone please move in and fill the seats that are empty in the middle of the rows? I know I hate to do this to all, the, to all those of you that got convenient aisle seats, but would you please do that? Because people will continue to come in and need a seat, and, and there's virtually no seats available now. So I'd appreciate it if you do that. Go ahead and just move in. You can tell I'm a professor. I'm used to telling students what they ought to be doing. <laughs> but I, I seriously would appreciate it if you would uh, make sure that there aren't, uh, that, that seats are available so that uh, as people come in, they don't have to stand. And uh, those of you that have decided you don't have to do that, I guess that's, you show that you also have been students and realize you don't have to do what professors ask. <laughs> It's really a pleasure to introduce our opening plenary speaker, Christos Cassandras, who is professor of manufacturing and electrical and computer engineering at Boston University. Uh, those of you that have read his Vita uh, and his short bio in the program have seen that there's a lot of impressive things to be said about Christos. <coughs> One of the first striking things is that he has his bachelor's degree from Yale, his master's degree from Stanford, and his PhD from Harvard. Uh, as, as a, as a non-native U.S. citizen, he misunderstood you're only supposed to apply to those schools, not actually get a degree from all three of them. <laughs> Since finishing his PhD at uh, Harvard with Professor Larry, Larry Ho, uh, Christos has been uh, in the academic world, but has also been extensively involved in uh, consulting with industry, and I think you'll see that in his talk, his uh, understanding of and his touch with real world problems has been uh, one of the hallmarks of his career. Most of you, of course, know him as the editor of the transactions on automatic control, the IEEE uh, Bureau on Automatic Control. So uh, many of you have probably had correspondence, uh, pleasant or otherwise, uh, from Professor Cassandra. When he sent me this title, Let's Control Everything, uh, it was provocative, and I, uh, I shook my head and said, I can see there's a guy whose child is not yet a teenager, but I guess he's going to clarify what it is he hopes to control when he, when he says uh, everything. So we welcome, please, uh, Professor Cassandra's. Let me start by uh, acknowledging that uh, this title is uh, somewhat subtle. And the reason it's subtle is because uh, there are three different nuances to, to this title. Uh, first of all, you can read this as let's control everything, as opposed to let's control everything. Or perhaps the more subtle, let us control everything, if you get my trick. And uh, hopefully in the next uh, 55 minutes or so, I'll be able to address all three different interpretations of this. <laughs> Central themes of this talk. Uh, I've chosen to put up front a list of the key ideas that have motivated me to put together this presentation. And you can also view this as kind of a uh, conceptual summary of what I'm going to be talking about. So, for starters, control mm -hmm. is pervasive. I think we all agree with that. I think you all know what I mean, so I won't say anything else about that. <laughs> Secondly, control is not just the systems of the form x dot equals f of x ut. What do I mean by that? I mean that there are lots of systems out there that simply do not look like an x dot equals f of x ut, at least not naturally. And yet they're interesting systems, they're important systems, they're exciting systems, and they're begging to be controlled. <laughs> so why not do it? Put another way, You've heard this old saying, if you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail to you. Then think of x dot equals f of x ut as a modeling framework, along with all the beautiful control theoretical methodology that we developed for it, as the main hammer of our craft. So rather than going around and looking for more nails to hit with this hammer, maybe we should spend some of our effort 
looking around to develop new tools that go along with his hands. Thirdly, control doesn't always have to be sophisticated. I don't mean that we should sort of reduce the level of our sophistication. I don't mean that at all. All I'm saying is that there happen to be a lot of interesting, usually unconventional types of systems, for which you can come up with some pretty simple controllers that work quite well, at least to get you to that 90% of the performance. Then you can put the sophistication into the remaining 10%. And that leads me to the next point, which is it's really the principles of control theory, the things that we all know and love, system dynamics, feedback, that probably matter more than specific methodologies. And the last point I want to make here is a quote, which I can't take credit for. And the quote says, when our classifications start breaking down, we know we're learning something exciting. Which I think is pertinent to our field and a lot of other fields right now, because I think we're faced with many interesting, exciting new problems, as well as different kinds of systems. And these types of problems and systems, somehow, they just don't fit very neatly into any of the categories that we've created. They can't be pigeonholed very conveniently. And that's good. Because it probably means that we're pushing the envelopes of our intellectual horizons and are stepping into new domains, and there's a lot of excitement. So, to go to an outline of this presentation, what I've chosen to do is to give you a somewhat personal account of how the controlled mind brought up the whole mind, and since it's personal, it's mostly my own control mind, we can lead the solutions to creating unconventional, important, interesting, exciting problems, but at the same time, and I want to stress this, solving such problems can stimulate new theoretical developments. And the outline that I've chosen for, for my talk is more or less chronological. I'm going to go back about 20 years and try to describe some problems that in this particular case happen to be related to manufacturing systems and how trying to attack some of these unusual problems, the roots of the field of discrete event systems were developed. And then, over the ages, a uh, the whole theory surrounding discrete event systems and unconventional <coughs> systems in general uh, emerged, from which we learned quite a bit. And then from some of the things that we learned, uh, in the 90s, uh, I personally and a lot of my friends were involved with other unusual systems like elevators, Australian mines, air traffic control, communication hazards, more, more recently command control systems. I'm not going to be able to cover all of these, but I hope to cover at least a couple of these unusual problems and fun. And lastly, uh, and very importantly, uh, I hope to have time to talk a little bit about the future as I see it. And here are some key words that I see very closely linked to our uh, future in this field, hybrid systems, complexity, computation. So, without any further ado, let's go back about 20 years when I, at least, was sort of looking at some unconventional problems in manufacturing systems about which I knew nothing about. If you're familiar with manufacturing systems, this is going to be not very interesting to you. If you're not, the building block of the manufacturing system is your work center. And a work center looks roughly like this. There's an area, space, called a buffer, where parts are accumulated. And then they move to uh, different kinds of equipment, which generically you can uh, call a machine. Usually there's some sort of material handling equipment that uh, is responsible for moving parts from the buffer to the machine. And the parts come from some other kind of material handling device, in this case a very uh, simple conveyor belt over here. And they come, and they roll in, and they get moved into the machine. And when they move to the machine, the machine starts coming and uh, they start processing the parts. So you look at this as a, as a little system here. And uh, you say, well, it's model. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to uh, kind of uh, replace the Mickey Mouse icons with more dignified representation. And the first level of abstraction that uh, people have come up with is something like this. Here what we do is uh, we replace the buffer with a little box and the machine with a little circle. And the red blobs are supposed to represent the parts that are in the process. The relevant interesting variables and quantities related to this model are uh, the times at which the different parts arrive. There's a sequence, A1, A2. There's the processing time associated with the parts, and then the departure time. In addition, there is an X of T that starts looking like a state variable, which indicates how many parts we have in the system. K is the maximum number, the capacity of the work center. And I just want to point out that X of T is uh, a discrete quantity, and not negative integers normally. So you look at this and you say, gee, that doesn't really look like, like x dot equals f of x to t. 
But since, and I confess I was one of those, all I had was a hammer, like 20 years ago, I said to myself, well, let's force the next guy to level next UT to this. And if you do that, it's not very difficult to come up with another level of abstraction, the old tank, fluid in the tank model. And in this case, uh, you think of parts as being essentially water molecules drifting down. You can control the arrival rate of the molecules. You can control the departure rate of the molecules. And it's not very difficult to come up also with an X type of F of XCT. It's not very elegant looking, but it's pretty simple. Now, that's basically uh, the uh, rate at which the level varies. So it changes equal to the lambda minus 2 difference, except that it has to stay constant uh, when you're at uh, the bottom tank or you use a capacitor. So that looks like a little promising. And uh, of course we would say let's use this continuous model to solve some problems. And maybe some problems are easy to solve that way, but some aren't. So I'd like to pose the question, is this the appropriate model for some of the problems that were posed to us? And let me give you at least a couple of the limitations of the continuous flow model which is so appealing to us. One that's fairly obvious is you really can only analyze the average behavior of the system. Uh, typically, parts and other things like messages and communication networks, tasks in the computer, are not very orderly and deterministic. So, if you only model uh, the behavior, the arrival of the parts behavior with just the single numbers, you typically will miss a lot of the higher moments that go into describing the statistical behavior of the system. But perhaps more importantly, you're missing something else. You're missing the ability to control certain features of the system when there are uh, issues related to part-by-part -part behavior. For example, if somebody asks you the question, here's the end part, can you guarantee that you can process and complete processing of this part within the next e time unit? Well, of course I can't answer that question. How can I identify the end part among the zillions of molecules in this fluid model? Perhaps you want to adopt a control policy which says, look, this part is within t time units from its due date, which means the time that it really has to come out of the factory. <coughs> How can I do that if I cannot identify this part? And more generally, if you want to prioritize by distinguishing between different kinds of parts, like in the uh, little Mickey Mouse picture that I had before, I had red and yellow parts, I can't do it. All right? So there are limitations to this uh, type of representation. Things can only get more interesting when you go into a real system in which you have uh, n sequential operations and word centers cascaded that you have to deal with. So, to take a look at a more realistic type of a model like that, uh, let's also introduce some performance metrics. Well, the first one that's pretty obvious is to, if you want to make as high as possible, you want to produce as much as you want. The other that's also important is delay. Where delay is simply the time it takes. For any part, you go from this point to this point, you can think of it, if you like, as the response time of the system. Suppose that lambda was a control there, and you wanted to really control it in order to uh, presumably achieve good performance. Well, if you increase lambda, it stands to reason that you will increase the through, which is good. You want to produce a lot. But it turns out, at the same time, you also increase the average delay, which is bad. And in fact, this relationship between two and an average delay is very well known. It looks pretty much like this. It's a nonlinear relationship where this is the best we can do in terms of two, this is the system's capacity. And in fact, it turns out that the more deterministic your system is, the more this, the shape of this curve tends to be like this, approach to this asymptotic behavior. It tends to have this very sharp behavior. So you see that if you try to operate your system around here, you become extremely sensitive to any kind of minor change that might push you to the right and uh, cause this explosion in the delay. This is the behavior you experience when you drive the highway and everything rolls along pretty good, and then suddenly there's a little accident and just one lane closes. For some reason, then you go from 80 miles an hour, oh, sorry, 65 miles an hour, down to 30. And you say, why the hell did this happen? And then as soon as we go around that, uh, that uh, point, then you know, the uh, average delay, which is precisely this behavior over here, goes down the way. All right, so this gives you a sense of the trade-off that we're after. And having given you this basic setup, now let me give you two problems. This is a real problem. So this is, uh, I would say, pretty much around 1979, it was presented to us by Fiat, the Italian automobile company, 
And I'm um, slightly simplifying and embellishing the problem, but it's, it's pretty realistic. So the objective uh, here is going to be to maximize uh, our throughput over here, viewed as a function of the capacities of these work centers. So here's the problem. Maximize the throughput subject to capacity constraint uh, by controlling all of these capacities. And you look at this and you, uh, you tell me probably that this is not a very interesting problem. After all, it's pretty static, the parametric optimization problem, you know, garden variety. So what's terribly interesting about this? This is a community of control people, dynamics. Where are they? Well, the difficulty comes from the fact that I have no idea what this function is over here, so I can use my arsenal of nonlinear optimization or whatever. Moreover, the way that PIA saw the problem is this. They said, we know that we cannot come up with any way to analytically describe the behavior of our little model here, but we have so many data. We can monitor this line over here and give you any data you want. Why can't you just come up with a model? And why can't you answer the following question about this was a paper to that? Every once in a while, things happen, like the work center breaks down for the uh, arrival. There might be, for example, uh, a, a sudden uh, impetus of new parts that are coming in and managing the process. And they knew that they should be moving things around, they should be changing these capacities. So the question was basically, how do I do that? If something goes wrong, my gut feeling is that I need to move my resources around, resources here being this capacity, how do I do that? So you see, you have a little bit of a problem here, and it turned out that the answer to this problem, or an answer to this problem, came from the control mindset. We started digging into this as a dynamic system, the viewed as a dynamic system, started looking into it, and then got some insights which led to a solution from this problem. But if you're not convinced by this argument, let me embellish it a little bit more and give you perhaps a more control-oriented problem next. This is a flow control problem. This is the same picture, except now I'm going to attach controllers uh, one for each work center, and I call them stop go controls because that's basically what they are. They're like traffic lights, and they decide if the part goes through or not. So if I focus on the I touch work center, my stop go controller will operate like this. It will look at the content of the work center, and if it's below a certain quantity in case of I, I will let it go through, otherwise, my stop. Turns out, in case of I, it's what is known as the number of Kanban allocated to stage up. And though I don't speak Japanese, uh, Kanban, uh, I know, is a Japanese word that means ticket or permit. And it's a famous word. This simple control policy was invented in the early 80s in Japanese factories and well, had amazing success. I mean, it literally revolutionized uh, the manufacturing system control community. It's used until today with uh, religious uh, significance. And uh, everybody that loves the Kanban control policy of manufacturing. And the only additional point I want to make here is that this is an example of feedback. Very simple, but it works very well, and it's extremely robust. Okay? So now, just to give it more control flavor, I'm using the symbol skew here because it's more clear to our hearts that they represent control parameters. And I'd like to formulate this problem. Once again, I'd like to maximize my throughput, but now I'm going to make a, I'm going to put a constraint of my average delay, and I have an additional constraint which I call a constraint of the system dynamics. I don't know what these are yet, but that's what I want to do. I want to incorporate the understanding of the dynamics of the system so that I can solve this dynamic optimization problem, flow control problems. All right. If you go one level down into this type of the model, there's an additional problem that around the early 80s people started also worrying about. And that is what is known as the supervisor control problem. So just to illustrate the problem, let me just take a look at a, a very simple, the simplest non-trivial model of the class that I just defined, where I have two work centers, and I'm using a compound based policy with a parameter set of one. Now there are a few rules that I must satisfy if I'm going to execute this Kanban policy at this level. Number one, machine one can only start when the buffer is empty. Number two, machine two can only start when the buffer is full. We've got to have something to process. And since 
Typically, this machine will go up and down with a fail and uh, have to come there. There are two more rules. The first is that machine one cannot start when machine two is down. And the last one says that if both machines are down, I will prioritize machine two. Think of this as control specifications. They're not very neat, elegant, or mathematically formulated, but they are constraints to be uh, respected nonetheless. And this gave rise to what is known as supervisor control problem. So what I've done so far is given you a, uh, a high-level description with a little bit of a flavor of how you might model the relevant problems here. And this sets the stage for what a bunch of people from our community uh, decided to tackle in the early 80s. And trying to solve these problems has led to new modeling frameworks that have attempted to parallel the next value of F of X and E modeling framework. And also, what is now known as supervisory control theory, perturbation analysis theory, and I've listed here just a sample of some of the people that uh, were uh, major contributors in the early and mid 80s to this work. Well, let me focus a little bit at this point, the model of framework. When we were looking at these problems, all of us from different directions came to the realization that our main difficulty with this model of framework was time. The very notion, the very role of time was different in these different systems. So let me illustrate that by trying to draw a contrast between what I'll call time-driven and event-driven systems. A time-driven system is a system we all know and love. It's a type of system that, if you look at a typical state trajectory of it, state trajectory of it, it will look like this. It's essentially the solution of some differential equation of this general form, which describes the dynamics. And the state space, at least in the scalar case, is usually the real line. So everything is nice and neat and elegant. And here you can see that it makes sense to think of time as an independent variable which sort of flows, and as it flows, things happen. In an event driven world, on the other hand, you really don't have this continuum of states. What you have is a pretty much arbitrary and sometimes very kind of inelegant looking state space. In this example, I just have four discrete numbers. <laughs> There's not even a clear way in which you can order them. For example, uh, in the case of a traffic light, that those state variables would be green, yellow, and red. I don't know how to order those. Be that as it may, if you try to parallel the state trajectory generation here, you might see your system be at state as two, then an event occurs and it causes you to jump to another state, another event occurs, and so on and so forth. So what you see here is a state trajectory that in some ways looks nice, speech wise is constant. In other ways, it's not so nice because it destroys the very notion of the derivative here. I can't even find any useful derivatives for such functions. But the other thing that you observe at the more intuitive level is that time here really doesn't play any crucial role in the evolution of the system. In fact, nothing is happening most of the time. The only thing that causes the, this, this uh, system to do anything interesting is when these events occur. So you're tempted to kind of give up on time as the independent variable and instead introduce these uh, objects called events that somehow happen asynchronously, in funny ways, and thus they transition. And if you do that, trying to parallel what we know about time driven systems, you might try to find a representation for the state dynamics where the prime here indicates the next state. Okay? But I really don't know what I mean by this yet. I'm just trying to draw on this representation and hopefully I can come up with something. So that is the contrast between event driven and time driven systems. And, and the notion of time here, you see, is really different. Time really becomes a state variable, not the independent variable, as I hope to illustrate next. So what, what I want to do next is give you an overview of one of the simplest modeling frameworks that we can develop in order to capture this kind of unconventional system so that we can go back to our uh, problem of controlling this manufacturing system. And I call this modeling foundations. And the basic foundation that uh, many people uh, relied on is the notion of an automaton, which is something that was invented in the 60s primarily for computer science purposes. I'll give you a very simplified version of it as a phi couple, in which P e and X are the easy uh, components, uh, X is the state space, E is an event set, of which I mean just a set in which you define all the relevant events for your system. Gamma of X is something we associate with every possible state x 
and it is intended to capture the substance of all the events here that happen to be feasible at that state. And f is a state with this function, which basically tells us what happens if we're at some state in x, and in red happens, how do we make the transition to the next state? And I only want to point out that it is a partial function in, uh, yeah, uh, in the sense that it is not defined for all elements in this event set, but only those events that are actually feasible. And of course, you have to have an initial state. Now, I want to point out that this is a dynamic system. You may not like it because it's not x value for set of x to k, but it is a dynamic system. Here it is. Here is our black box, which tells us how state conditions occur. Here is the input. <laughs> this happens to be a string of objects called events. So here is the output. State here. Absent here is time. There's nothing here about time. Which is okay for a lot of problems, like supervisory control problems. It may not be okay for other types of problems that involve time. So that forces us to add one more element to this modeling setting and create what we call a kind of automaton. The new element is this D here, and we call it block structure. D is a set. It's a set of sequences. One sequence associated with each event that we care to define. And we call this sequence V sub i a block or lifetime sequence. And think of it as follows. Events are born, they live, and they die. An event is born when it becomes feasible. It's given a lifetime. When its lifetime expires, it dies, which means that it occurs. And so on and so forth. It may be reborn and it dies again depending on the state position. And here is the new picture of this dynamic system. No longer do I have an external event sequence of people. Instead, I have n, if for simplicity, n is the number of events that I find in this set. And these are bumped into my black box, and now it's the responsibility of the black box to internally tell me what the next event is going to be, so that I can tell you what the next state is going to be. So we need an internal mechanism. Things are getting more interesting. Rather than getting to things uh, 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 described to you things at too abstract a level, let me just describe to you how this time phenomenon is intended to work, and the bottom line will emerge. Well, let's say that our current state is x. We are in time state x, therefore we know what events are feasible to this part of our model definition. The current event is the event that put us at that state. The current time is the time that's associated with the event. And here's something new. This is a bunch of new state variables, y sub i, each one associated with an event that is easy. And we call these the residual lifetimes. So every event has this much light to go, which makes it a little bit simpler to define what the next or trigger event in prime is. What do you do? The obvious thing. You line up all of the residual lifetimes that happen to be equal. Find the smallest one, find the event that gives you the smallest one, call that the next event. It's a sensible thing to do. Then the next event time is simply the previous time plus whatever came out of this minimization. So you see, time is there, but it's really not an independent variable anymore. It's really something that just kind of gets updated and doesn't happen about every once in a while. And the next state is easy to define now that we have a trigger event, because we know what f is. And the last piece of the puzzle is how do we update these additional state variables? There is an awkward looking equation that I won't bug you with because my next slide is going to tell you exactly what this uh, uh, equation is. Is uh, intended to do. But I will close the sequence of uh, descriptions of my system here by putting out this picture. So here's my input, these are the event lifetime sequences, and my output is the state sequence. And see here what's happening inside the box. We have a state x which is discrete and satisfies this update equation for which you need to know what e prime is, but you also need this other bunch of state variables which look like this equation. And notice that these state variables here are event plots. That's where time went. Time became a state variable here. Okay, let me give you a very simple example of how this time phenomenon would work. So going back to this work sample model, if you recall what it is, you have a buffer, you have a machine, and you have arrivals that occur on the left, departures that occur on the right. Let's see if we can model this now that we believe this is a legitimate, interesting, dynamic system. Uh, as an atomic, 
So it makes sense to use two events, A and B, for a rather than departures. Our state space is clearly the number of parts residing in this work center, 0, 1, 2. And for every state, we need to find what events are feasible when. Well, this is easy. All events are always feasible, except when the state is 0. 0 means I'm many. Well, I can't have a departure from one of the systems. So this is an example of an infeasible event. The state transition mechanism is pretty simple. It just says, go up, oops, go up by, by one when the arrival occurs, go down by one when the departure occurs, and this is my input. An event sequence, lifetime sequence for the arrival, an event lifetime sequence for departures. In this model, they're supposed to be given. And here is how you would construct a typical set of that, a typical state projection of the system. So let's say we start out empty. It's only possible to have one event at arrival. This is the lifetime that my input sequence Give me so clearly the next event is an arrival, which will put me into a state of one. At this point, two events are due, both an arrival and a departure. This is how I have somebody in the system that may actually be. Compare the two lifetimes for my input information, find the smallest one, it's an arrival again. So we go to state two. Now, we need a third uh, lifetime to describe the behavior of the arrival process, but we don't need another D. Because we have a residual lifetime. This is what an equation that I didn't describe comes in. So that equation, all it does, it basically takes the original <laughs> lifetime, subtracts the amount of time by which you move forward, and gives you the result. That's all. And now that you get the picture, you can see what happens. All you do is you update your state, you line up your event lifetime, pick the smallest one, and so on and so forth. And that's all there is to it. Sometimes we like to describe these types of dynamic systems satisfying a max plus or min plus or min minus algebra. Why? Because it turns out that the only interesting operators here are the max or min operator, which is trouble, and the plus, which basically means time. Time goes forward, not back. Okay, so the last piece here, the puzzle is what happens if things are not deterministic? So we simply add one more adjective to our model. We call this a stochastic time automaton. Now, the plot starts to exist of stochastic processes instead of given sequences. We associate probability distributions with the sequences, and we give rise to what is known in the stochastic process literature as a generalized Markov process for the GS and P. Oh, and by the way, <laughs> if you want to simulate systems like that, uh, you go to your simulator, and your pseudo random number generator is basically responsible for sampling and generate examples of this uh, lifetime so you can do your business. So, having given you this uh, model setting, I'm ready to go back to that uh, problem that I was talking about before. <coughs> Recall, it's just uh, uh, a system here for which I want to maximize the throughput by simply identifying the uh, values of the capacities of the work center. And as I expressed before, I really don't know what this function is like. This is too complex a model. I can't come up with an analytical expression for it. I can produce state trajectories, which means I can go to the factory, stand there for a week, and observe anything you want to observe in terms of the state variable that I've defined a minute ago here. But how would I do this information? Well, when you look at this boring parametric optimization problem, your first instinct is to do the obvious thing, which is right and there. What do I mean by that? You can go to the factory and just observe it, or you can simulate it if you prefer. Okay. And here is the system for the simulated version thereof. And what do you do with trial and error analysis? You pump in input in terms of design parameter information or operating functions and control parameter information, and you wait to obtain the output side estimates or measurements of performance. And what you do is you repeatedly change the input side so you can observe what happens on the output side so that you can answer multiple what if questions. And you can see that if you ask n what if questions, you need n plus 1 of these lines. Well, the birth of perturbation analysis came about when we put forth the following plan. Rather than doing this brute force trial and error analysis, wouldn't it be nice if there was a little analytical toolbox in here sitting side by side with the system 
a set of algorithms, if you will, control or optimization or estimation or everything to put together, so that along with the yellow information, which is what you would normally do for one to fly, you also supply the blue box with this type of information. What if some parameter whose value is, let's say, currently A, is replaced by the value B? And you do that for a bunch of uh, what if questions that you want to ask. And I mean thousands, if not millions, not just three or four. So that, in the output side, you will obtain answers to this what if question. So the idea here is that if this works, from one single trial, this one, you will get simultaneously answers to multiple what if questions automatically, mm -hmm. potentially millions of them. So you look at this and you say, just like I would say, Oh, I've been through these presentations a billion times in the box scenarios where magical things happen. And you would be perfectly justified in asking me, what is going on here? You know, how do you pull this rabbit out of the hat? Well, of course, about 15 years of hard work that have gone into explaining this simple magic trick. But I would like to at least illustrate to you that this is possible with a simple example. So going back to my old friend here, the, the word center model, Let's say that we fix the capacity of this work center to 2. That's my observed second path. And it might look like this. This is that piecewise constant typical state trajectory that I was alluding to before. So all you see here is the state of the system x, which is the constant of this work center, jumping between 0, 1, and 2. If you have something happening like an external arrival while you're at 2, you can't accept it to stay at 2. So this is it. And I can observe it. Now here's a, here's a game we can play. We're going to ask the what if question. What if two were replaced by one? Of course you can go and do it. But we don't want to do that. We want to be smart. We want to see if we can construct through a thought experiment a blue sample path that would accurately represent exactly what would happen to the system if two were replaced by one by just looking at the green stuff. So, the first thing that you observe is that obviously Nothing different is going to happen between these two center paths until you hit this point. This is the point where, for the first time, the green system is going to go to two, and you know that the blue system can. Well, that's not a big deal. Up to now, therefore, I dealt with like, the perturbation with the state is zero. And at this point, I observe that I'm going to have a jump from one to two. And the blue system is not going to do that, so you can immediately infer that delta x at this point becomes minus 1. So that's really easy to do, it's not a big deal. Then you continue on, and you realize that for a while, all that's happening between the green and the blue path is that they're off by minus 1 until you get to this point. This is the point where the green system is at 1 and it's about to go to 0, and the blue system is already at 0. So what happens right here is that the two systems are preset, pre synchronized. But well, that's also easy to detect. It happens whenever the green system makes a jump to zero, at which point delta x gets reset to zero, that's it. So I can construct any blue path you want with great absolute accuracy by simply waiting to observe either this event or that event. In between those two events, setting my delta x equals minus one, otherwise delta x equals zero. So this is a simple illustration, admittedly, for a very simple system of why what I showed before as a kind of a magical trick, actually works very simply. So what you observe here is that the perturbation dynamics, the dynamics of delta x, were able to be derived from observations of the non-sample path only. In other words, I was able to come up with a perturbation dynamics model that looks like this. You see, if I know my delta x at 9t, I can tell you what the perturbation is going to be at the time t plus delta, parameterized by the theta, the parameter that I have right now that I'm observing the system under, and a given delta theta. And by the way, with delta theta, you don't necessarily have to think of it as a small perturbation. Okay. And the important thing is that the small perturbation dynamics are driven by the observation of the nominal system at time t. Only that observation. So you observe something. And you have an analytical model, so that's what the perturbation dynamics <coughs> are. Why does this really work? Well, it works because I kind of cheated a little bit. I didn't just <coughs> adopt an input output view of the world. I went inside the black box and I understood the dynamics of my nominal system. 
I understand the structure of the system. And it is that extra bit of knowledge that really came out of my control mindset, my obsession with understanding system dynamics, that allowed me to, to develop this type of perturbation dynamics. Well, needless to say that once this kind of conceptual breakthrough was made, a whole theory was developed. We call it constructability theory because its essence is to find out when you can do what I did in the previous slide. Construct a state trajectory under a given perturbation if I know what is happening to my nominal system. Um, you can play this game by focusing your interest not on the state itself, but on different performance measures of the system. And if you're interested in making delta theta go to zero, because you'd like it to work with sensitivities and gradients, ultimately, that's what ultimately came from known as perturbation analysis. So going back to the previous problem, the buffer allocation problem, now that you understand what the spirit of the approach was, if I define a vector, an allocation vector of the capacities at each one of the main work centers, what we did was basically this. We fixed one of these allocations, say A1. Omega here is just a catch-all input, everything else that drives the system. And we observed the performance of the system. Then we simply deduce from one trial, from one observation, just point online, what would have happened if A1, some allocation factor, were replaced by A2, blah, 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 and different allocations? So this is observed, this is inferred. We call this concurrent estimation because we concurrently estimate the behavior of the system in terms of its performance measure for n different performance settings. And how big is that? Well, if your search space is small enough, let's say a few million, depending on how far you have, you can play this game for all of the possible allocations. But since combinatorial complexity sooner or later is going to kill you, you have to get a little bit more clever in terms of choosing which n allocations you want to study in your head again, this hypothetical set of construction, and then build a little bit of an optimization framework around that and do something you're not going to get into. Okay, so having said that now, I would like to open a little parenthesis. Because at this point, I've told you uh, what happened in the 80s in terms of trying to solve some unconventional problems and tackling some unconventional systems, and therefore uh, developing some theory, which of course you'd like to publish. Well, Mary Wan was kind enough to let me uh, share this uh, slide with you. He gave a plenary talk about uh, three years ago, in which he showed this information. And what it is, is some anonymous referee comments from 1983 paper that he published with some of his colleagues in the supervisory control area, which was one of the areas that were developed in parallel in the discrete event systems uh, field. And here are some of the uh, comments that we got from leading journals. Uh, comments like uh, a dominant complex control the steering, and so on and so forth. I don't even know what this comment means here. The <laughs> His conclusion was that crossing cultural divides can be a chilly business, which is a very warm's flowery, interesting way of saying something that maybe many, many of us feel, which is, yeah, I'm telling you here, let's control everything. Let's go out there and boldly face interesting problems that just don't fit the mold that we used to. But perhaps there's a price to be paid unless we all become open minded. Uh, but of course, without compromising our standing. Well, be that as it may, this is one of the lessons that you learn when you try to be a little different. Let me move on to the 90s. As I said, uh, during the 80s, after we solved some interesting problems, we learned a lot and we developed theory. From this theory, we were now ready to face more interesting problems with more guts, because now we knew we had an arsenal. I'm going to talk to you here only about one of the more interesting and fun problems that I personally had the good fortune to uh, deal with. And that is to do with How do you control elevators? Well, a building like this hotel is actually an interesting dynamic system when it comes to controlling elevators. But here's a building, and here are some elevators, some going up, some going down, up, down, how they move, so on and so forth. And Here's a cross section of the different floors. 
So what this does indicate here is that there's four passengers at this floor right here that, uh, uh, that are there and would like to go down as opposed to, let's say, one passenger wants to go up. Now, this is a very complex system. Some of the elements of complexity are huge state space. Movement constraints. If you're a passenger in an elevator that uh, was just boarded at the lobby and you want to go to the third floor, the elevator just can't stop on the second floor and reverse its course just because it makes sense from an optimization uh, uh, perspective. You have to deliver the passengers. Incomplete state information. Well, you never know if there are four people at this floor. You know that there's one or more because somebody has pushed the button, and that's about it. So this is a big problem. And by the way, speak of uh, being a huge state space is a combinatorial <laughs> explosion. A really big combinatorial explosion. For a typical building, it's not a long to be based on the state space of the order of 10 to the 50. Interesting little system to deal with. Well, we're presented with this uh, with the, the problem of controlling elevator systems uh, by Otis Elevator, uh, more or less in the late 80s. And essentially, the problem was, how should an elevator respond to calls? Let me shorten this question a little bit more for you. You can think of an elevator as essentially having three controlled decisions to make as it moves up and down. As it approaches the floor, so moving up, you can choose to stop, you can choose to just go, even if there's passengers there, or you can cho choose to just reverse its direction. And the goal is to reduce waiting time, but also there's some fairness issues, because you can come up with some control elements that are very unfair certain floor. So there's some interesting twists there. And the challenge, of course, was can you outperform existing patented elevator dispatch control? This challenge was posed by a computer scientist and a control engineer. So if the next few slides sound a little bit like this class of jokes, uh, like a priest and a rabbi walking to the bar, and the priest says this, the rabbi says that, uh, this is uh, intended to be so, except the priest and the rabbi are going to be a computer scientist and a control engineer. Please uh, notice that this is something cheap, and don't take it too seriously, okay? <laughs> so the first question was, how would you guys proceed? So the sponsor is there, you know, you have this meeting, and the first question is, how would you proceed? Well, the computer scientist says, I'm going to build the database. The control engineer says, I'm going to build the model. The <laughs> computer scientist says, next, I'm going to collect data, populate the database. The control engineer says, well, now that I have a model, I'm going to formulate the control and optimization problem that we have to then try to solve. So far, so good. Here's where you notice some divergence. <laughs> Next thing the computer science says, I'm going to design the user. The problem is here, assuming it comes from this community, we probably say, there's a solution. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really good control here. We will probably say, so, <laughs> there's a slight difference in cultures here, which is okay. Two weeks later, a few people are ready to propose projects. The computer scientist proposes a half a million six month project in which he says that he will deliver a database driven expert system using AI methods and it updates full knowledge running the land of which sounds very impressive. The control engineer says, I need about 50k to buy it here, and let me investigate what insight I can gain from the system dynamics so that I can then seek a solution to this really complex dynamic optimization problem. A very sensible approach. Uh, if you're the sponsor and you're looking at these two responses, you probably picture Control engineer sitting there, kind of staring at a blank piece of paper, trying to come up with inspiration. Whereas the computer scientist is punching numbers, getting results. The saving grace for the control engineer is that he's only asking for about 50k, which is kind of noise, the big picture. So he gets the project. So does the computer scientist. Six months later, it's judgment time. So the question is posed can you guys love the form or existing technology? The computer scientist has success. The expert system finds solutions. Well, admittedly, the non open is good. But that's because we need a faster CPU for the neural network train. We need $20,000 more company. The control engineer says, well, here's an algorithm that improves performance by 20%, and I'm happy with that. 
I'm really disappointed because I can only put the burdens of my solution beyond my only probability, not the probability of one dying. <laughs> of course, at this point, you might argue that the spectral engineers really have to be a little bit naive, right? But give it as a trade, hey, he delivered some results, and that, that's good. So, two years later, just to give an update of what's going on, Computer science is still adding rules to the extra system to train the neural network. I'll tell you, the user interface is a real beauty. <laughs> the control engineer is still fine tuning his algorithms and he's up to 30% improvement. He's now asking for half a million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, all getting aside, let's just uh, take a glimpse of the control engineer's approach to this uh, problem for the elevator. If we look at the elevator dispatch the problem, we soon realize that uh, it makes sense to break it into what I call a different scenario. There's this scenario, which is called the upbeat scenario. This is the early morning in a state office building where people come at the lobby and it's basically a face of the problem distributing them over the different floors. Later on in the day, you have what's called the lunchtime scenario. This is where people go out to lunch and some are coming back, so between probably 11.30 and 2 o'clock, you have to pull up and down traffic. This is the duel of the morning traffic, the downbeat scenario, where you're empty the building, and then there's the interval of traffic during the day, which you can also think of as noise that you can superimpose on the other scenario. Well, I'm going to focus on the upbeat problem, because it's the simplest to describe, it's more elegant, uh, and uh, I think it will serve my purposes. So, if you look for a model using that same level of abstraction that we're talking about in manufacturing, you can pose this problem as one in which you have passengers arriving at the lobby and going to the queue. Here's your controller, and your job is to distribute the passengers over an identical elevator. Notice that you have the capacity for strength of this elevator. Well, here's a way not to control the system, uh, which uh, gets to the point of Look at for insights, try to understand what the problem is like, and then develop the theory. So these blinking doors are supposed to indicate three elevators which are available at the lobby. The problem is that if that scenario emerges, and there's three guys that show up, chances are that each person goes and takes an elevator, so that a second later, they're gone, there's no elevators. Now more people start coming in, they don't have any elevators, and they're probably going to have to wait because, for example, if one of these guys wants to go to the top floor, so by the time that the elevators come down, it's been five minutes or so, and then they all come down at the same time, which sounds really dumb. But here's a better way to do things. You disable two of the three elevators. It shouldn't be too hard to do. But so when the three people come, you force them to go to the final elevator, and when that happens, you have the other two available. Well, it turns out, that you can indeed formally show by formulating the market decision problem, real, real control, real systems theory stuff, you can prove that uh, under the standard, of course, technical assumption, that uh, you can uh, get an optimal policy in the sense of minimizing the average waiting time through what is called a threshold based control. And the threshold parameters depend on the model parameters, the fastest arrival rate of the car. Car, by the way, is the same as elevators, what the word that they use in the elevator business to talk about elevators. So the control behaves in this way. You load one car at a time, by essentially shutting down the other cars, and then you dispatch the star when the number of passengers inside the car reaches or exceeds this type of uh, threshold. How do you enforce that? Well, typically you they put scales under the floor so you can estimate the number of people from the car. Well, it's not that easy though to, to uh, implement such a controller because this system is not stationary at all. For example, these are real data over the course of about like 8.30 to 9.30, one hour, broken into five minute intervals. And these are the rates at which people arrive over these uh, uh, five minute intervals. So really what you have to decide is to pick 12 threshold parameters, one for each five minute interval, but you also want to be able to automatically adjust them online. Why? Because things change. For example, if uh, this building suddenly a cafeteria is built at the third floor, the traffic patterns are going to change. So you don't want to go back to the drawing board. You want the system to be flexible and intelligent enough to adjust those parameters. And that will control right? Our concurrent estimation approach, which I alluded to before, 
essentially goes as follows. Choose any of uh, any set of 12 thresholds, any value you want, one for each line you need to Observe the system. Just observe it, just see what happens. And learn from it. Basically, by constructing state trajectories of what would have happened to the system had you changed the original value to something else, always in your head, based on this idea of terms and perturbation analysis. And at the end, you need an optimization scheme, which I don't mean to under uh, stress the importance of, I just don't remember to get into it. You do need that last part uh, to, uh, to do the final adjustment. And here are some typical results. So here what I'm showing is uh, the uh, yellow curve is the control engineer downward to both CEPA, and the other curves correspond to other dumb or mildly intelligent, reasonably heuristic algorithms. And the thing to notice is that if you look at the envelope that sort of hugs all of the possible control schemes that you can come up with, the yellow one sort of does that, except down here, there's an explanation for that that can go in. The last question that I want to pose here is, uh, okay, so how, how well does this do? Uh, well, it turns out that it does pretty well in the sense that you only need about five periods, five estimation intervals, if you're familiar with uh, stochastic control, stochastic optimization types of values, which in real life means that you need about five real days. In about a week, you're able to adapt uh, and choose the right control parameters for this simple controller. And this is what we refer to as rapid learning. Remember, we're not dumb. Control engineers and control computer scientists are not the only ones that can come up with sexy acronyms. <laughs> so, having said that, let me move a little bit to the future. I'm only going to spend about five minutes uh, talking about some uh, key concepts that I see personally as the key uh, ideas and uh, Projects that I want to work on for the next decade or so. Complexity, hybrid systems, computation challenges, new optimization patterns. Down here at the bottom, I could have listed more opportunities. My, my point here is that this is not just a pipe dream, like, right? you know, oh yeah, well, all of a sudden the hybrid system sounds good, so let's go write some papers on hybrid systems. In reality, there are opportunities. This is interesting. This is called MIT. It's called Mixed Emissions Control Autonomy. Never mind the sex acronym. This is something that DARPA, by extension the US government, has come up with as recently as three months ago. And it's part of the bigger picture where somebody has conceived of the dream, uh, hopefully not the dream, uh, that control theory can be used in command control systems to revolutionize the way that the US government conducts its uh, military operations. Well, that's an opportunity. And you should go and take a look at it. It's, uh, it's a beautiful reveal of control theory, system theory uh, opportunities. Well, let me talk a little bit about how to talk about all these things. I just want to talk a little bit about complexity. Because I think that complex systems are really good. Well, from my point of view, I don't want to try and define complexity. It's too difficult to task, too controversial. We don't know yet what it is. There's different aspects to it. But from my point of view, if I'm faced with a complex system, and I, I have a good gut feeling about a complex system, it's like the elevator system, okay? I know that there are three limits that I, I'm faced with. The first one is what I'll call the one over square two, square t limit. This is the limit that says that if you want to increase by one order of magnitude in the accuracy of your estimation, you need two orders of magnitude in the learning that. For example, if you do a Monte Carlo simulation to estimate something, if you want to reduce the variance of your estimator by one order of magnitude, we all know that you have two orders of magnitude in time, more learning time, to achieve that. The second limit is the anti hardware We all know that the strategy space is given by the decision space raised the information space power. <coughs> Pretty tough to be. And the third limit is what is known as the no free lunch, the NFL limit. This is actually uh, a theorem that was formally proven recently. And it simply captures in a theoretical way the trade off between generality and efficiency of an algorithm. Algorithm here, think of it generically. It's something which is intended to solve a tough problem. And the idea is that if you develop a very general algorithm, chances are is that it's not going to be very efficient. So if you develop a really neat, fast, efficient algorithm, chances are is that it's only going to apply to a small class of the world. It's like you know, linear systems. Fantastic stuff for linear systems, but linear systems are just a small dot in the bigger landscape. So 
things are pretty tough limits. But things are even worse because the effect of this three limits is multiplicative, not additive. So if you have a, an estimation problem coupled with the combinatorial problem, things are really bad. In short, this is really scary stuff. And you know, if I'm a guy who wants to face this last problem, I, I wouldn't necessarily uh, blame anybody for walking, for walking away. But if you decide, decide to face this limit, then chances are that you're going to go to this motherhood and have to buy a picture. The hierarchy of the composition makes sense. Uh, I'm not going to again attempt to give you a precise definition of how you hierarchically decompose a complex system. Suffice it to state that, roughly speaking, usually at the bottom here, you define physical processes which happen to correspond to like all time driven systems. So, for example, if you talked about a manufacturing environment, this is where you try to come up with models of how the physical world works in terms of how you, you drill holes and you relate and you cut things and so on and so forth, uh, perform chemical uh, transformations in material. Then there's another level which I call the extreme process because this is the level at which you push buttons and you make things that, uh, and make sure that things start and stop at the right time. And up here, I don't even know what you call it. I mean, depending on the domain, you can use your own word. But the point is that roughly this decomposition goes along with the time scale and the choice of model. And so, you know, the bottom here usually Resort to differential equations, they try to prevent the x t, but when you get to this level, you might resort to other types of models like the model that I was describing before. The reason for my putting this up is because if I focus on the two bottom parts of this hierarchy, the speedy head system and the physical, or time driven process, what I'd like to do is I'd like to put a control structure around this, uh, this little framework. And you can see that if I were to block out, for example, the stop loss, we would have our classic feedback loop control, which now acquires an extra dimension of having a discrete event loss attached to it. But things are not that simple. For example, I'm always mystified by this arrow. What the hell does this arrow mean? Everybody brought this arrow and they break down the system into convenient components. But what does this arrow really mean? Maybe it's trivial, like, you know, just passing data back and forth. Maybe not. I, for one, have to face at least once with a problem where if you don't do the arrow right, you get completely erroneous answers. I mean, you're way off. Okay, so this is some of the hybrid system, and I have just two more slides to go. I wanted to sort of close as I started by talking to you about some real world problems that, that motivated at least me to get into this field. So, here, this is a problem that, that was presented uh, to me by another. Uh, Large manufacturing organization very recently. And the problem is, how do you integrate process controls and operations control? Which is another way of saying, how do you integrate quality and time? Quality corresponds to process control. Quality is the business of developing better process control to make better parts. On the other hand, operations control is obsessed with time. You try to get quality, but not in unreasonable time. So when you think about it, uh, you have two different uh, worlds that are sitting together, and I've personally had the fun experience of sitting in a table where literally on one side you have the process control guys, which usually come from background like physics, material science, and so on, and the operations control world. And it dawned on me that the two just did not communicate. Probably because these guys were coming from the time driven world, these guys were coming from the event driven world. So that's what has motivated me personally to get into the hybrid systems business and by trying to solve problems, which by the way, once you think a little bit, you can formulate very nice, very elegant control and optimization problems. I would like to uh, close by thanking uh, everybody who has contributed to this uh, overview talk, including all of my former and past students, uh, various colleagues uh, with whom I have had the pleasure to collaborate over the years, and certainly the, the usual sponsors. And I'd like to conclude by, again, repeating that, yes, I think we should all try to apply beautiful control principles like feedback and so on. But, let's not get carried away either, like this cowboy who may have been a control engineer in a previous life. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
thank you very much, Krista, for a very nice talk. Krista will be around, and I'm sure you'll have a lot of things you may want to discuss with him. I want to make a couple of announcements uh, before the sessions begin. First of all, at 12:30 today, there's a special.